and anybody else while I saw another hand. Okay, we're going to, do you have, okay, all right, well, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer for these needs and believe that he is able, amen? So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day, God. We thank you for this chance to come and to worship you freely with freedom. We thank you for the chance to open your word and to learn from it. God, I ask that you would touch each and every request that was mentioned. Lord, you see the families that were mentioned. You see the loved ones that were mentioned. You see those that are sick and need a touch of your healing. God, you see the unspokens, God. You see the needs that maybe weren't even mentioned, a hand wasn't even raised. But God, you know them and you are able. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't we just take a second and worship the Lord? Sweet presence of the Spirit in this place. We worship your name, God. Um, <clears throat> we worship your name, Jesus. We're thankful that you can feel the presence of God. Um, <clears throat> today we're going to talk about uh, something that's familiar, I believe, to most of us. But in the youth class, we have we had talked about experiencing Easter, and Brother Taylor's out of town this weekend. I don't know what he's been teaching in this class, but um, <clears throat> we finished with Easter, of course, on Easter Sunday in the youth class, and my wife and I were talking, and we felt like it was important for the young people to understand what happened between Easter and leading up to Pentecost Sunday, and was complete on Pentecost Sunday, so we've been talking about Activate and allowing the power of the Holy Ghost to be active in our lives. Um, Acts 1 verse 8 uh, tells us that you will be endued with power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You should be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and into the uttermost parts of the earth. Okay, So if you have your Bibles today, I want us to read Acts chapter 1. Verses 1 through 8. If you don't have your Bibles, Brother Artman's faithful, put the scriptures on the screen for us. But I wanted to give you an idea of what we were going to be talking about. <clears throat> Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says, The former treaties, or letter, or book, have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments upon the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me." For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses, not ye might, not ye may be, but ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and all Judea, and Samaria, and at the uttermost part of the earth. Now, <clears throat> I want us to back up and look at verse 1. Because to understand verse 8, we have to understand what's happening in the verses leading up to it. We read where Luke said, The former account, the former things, have I written unto you, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. The former account here is the Gospel of Luke. Okay? Luke wrote two volumes. He wrote Luke and he wrote Acts. At one time, these books were together. But imagine what it would be like if we stopped reading in the Gospel of John and we picked up in Rome about a guy named Paul and there was no Acts. Acts is that book of history that tells us how the disciples took the good news from Jerusalem all the way to Rome. Some theologians even call it the book of how the apostles took the gospel from Jerusalem to Rome. Okay, We call it Acts or the Acts of the Apostles. You cannot jump over the book of Acts. Brother Johnny James used to say, I don't care if you jump 
so far over the book of Acts from John that you jump to Revelation, Jude, 3 John, 2 John, 1 John, 2 Peter, 1 Peter, Philemon, Titus, Hebrews, James, Colossians, Philippians, 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, Ephesians, Galatians, 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, and Romans. All of those books tell you, go back to Acts. All of them, you have to go back and read what happened in Acts to understand the doctrine of the New Testament church. Okay? So, Acts is that book that takes us from Luke and the Gospel into the birth of the church. It's written in the literary style of the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It shows us that Luke had education and he had understanding. This is not just anybody writing any old story or book. Luke knew as to what he was speaking. There was a time when many thought that the book of Acts was uh, a romanticized piece of fiction or a novel that someone had written that maybe some of it was based in truth, but maybe some of it was exaggerated. But historians have realized through archaeology and through other documents that it was extremely accurate. And they now take for granted the historical accuracy of the book of Acts. It's not even questioned. What he wrote here absolutely, undeniably can be verified that it happened in history. Okay? That should build your faith that these aren't just stories that some preacher made up or some person made up. These really happen the way they said they happened. Okay? Who was Theophilus? He might have been a Christian wanting instruction. Perhaps he was a Roman official being briefed by Luke about the history of the Christian movement. Or the name could be symbolic because Theophilus means God lover. Any one of us here today could be Theophilus, as we all should and hopefully do love God. Most likely it was a Roman official because in Luke 1 and 3 he, he recognizes him in Luke as most excellent Theophilus. And since Luke was a companion with Paul, he was there awaiting Paul's execution. We know that in Acts 21 he was with Paul in Jerusalem. In Acts 27 he left and went with Paul to await to see Caesar Nero, the same Nero that persecuted the Christian church. He probably, most likely, wrote these as a defense of Paul and of the Christian faith, trying to get the Roman government to realize that it was harmless as some Roman officials had embraced it. It was innocent as some Roman judgment, judges could find no basis for prosecuting Christians. And it was lawful as it's the true fulfillment of Judaism, and Judaism was a recognized religion by the Roman government. So we must remember that Acts does not give us a full history of the church in this period, but it does give us some glimpse into what happened in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Uh, Brother Richardson mentioned that last night when he was speaking to the leaders, that Acts 1 and 8 gives us the outline for the rest of the book of Acts. The first eight chapters cover Jerusalem. The next set of chapters cover Judea. The last few chapters cover Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. How the disciples took the gospel to the whole known world. Then in verses 2 through 3, we read that before his ascension, it says, Until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he presented himself alive after his passion, and by many infallible proofs, being seen of them for, during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Jesus began to instruct the apostles regarding what they were going to do when he left them. He, said it, he established the fact that his resurrection had happened through many infallible proofs. One of these was Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that he revealed himself to at least 500 people at one time people that were still alive at the time that Paul was planting churches, 20, 30 years after the fact, that could verify we saw Jesus risen from the dead. And then teaching, even though what he taught was not recorded, we know according to what Luke tells us here that he taught them, he reiterated to them things pertaining to the kingdom of God. There are voices today, many Gnostic, New Age teachers, who would like to tell you, well, during that time period between when Jesus resurrected and when he ascended, 
he taught them new doctrines and new revelations and things that we have to rediscover and find. No, friend, he taught them the same things he taught them in his earthly ministry about the kingdom of God. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay? He reiterated to them that there is coming a day of judgment, and you need to take this message to the whole world. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, which is the name of Jesus, and pray for them to receive the Holy Ghost. He teach them the apostolic doctrine. He didn't teach them any new revelation. Then we read in verses 4 through 5 his final instructions to the disciples. Being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. He commanded them not to depart from that area, from Jerusalem. Because Jesus knew that there was nothing else for the disciples to do but wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. Because in themselves they could not fulfill the mission of the kingdom. They needed the power of God. He tells them, you shall, if you do what I'm telling you, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The idea of being baptized is to be immersed or covered over in something. Even as John baptized people in water, he immersed people fully in water. When we baptize people in the name of Jesus, we immerse them fully in water. We don't sprinkle them. So then, the Holy Spirit, we should be immersed into it. So perhaps it would be more useful when we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We have a tendency to ask people, you know, have you been baptized in the Holy Ghost? Or have you been filled with the Holy Ghost? Perhaps rather than talking about it as a one-time experience, we should refer to it as a continuing condition. Are you baptized in the Holy Ghost? Are you full of the Holy Ghost? Because if you got the Holy Ghost one time, like I did 20 years ago, okay, and you never spoke in tongues again, you never exercised the power of God in your life again, friend, you're not full of the Holy Ghost. You may have that initial evidence, that saving portion, but you're not fully walking in the power of God. It's a continuing condition. It has to be an everyday thing where we are living in the Spirit of God. The disciples asked Jesus a final question in verse 6. They said, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? This is a question they'd asked many times before because they believed that Jesus would establish an earthly political kingdom before ascending back into heaven. They thought he was coming to deliver them from Roman captivity, to restore to them the Jewish nation, to restore to them that that they'd had before. They didn't understand that God was trying to birth a spiritual kingdom. God was trying to save the whole world. And so Cal John Calvin said it this way. He said, marvelous is their rudeness that when as they had been diligently instructed by the space of three whole years, they portray no less ignorance than if they had never heard a word. There are as many errors in this question as there are words. Jesus has taught them for three years. I'm not come to set up a kingdom here on earth. I I've not come to set up a physical kingdom. I'm setting up a spiritual kingdom. He taught them about the spiritual birth, that you must be born of water and of spirit. And they're still not getting it. But Jesus doesn't get mad, he doesn't get flustered, he doesn't get angry, because he understands that the full revelation could not come until they'd been empowered by the Spirit of God. And so he tells them in verses 7 through 8, he said, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father hath put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. In other words, it's not for you to know, Jesus warned the disciples, against, it's not for you to know the timing in God's kingdom. Those things belong to God. It was wise that Jesus did not outline that this might be a two or three thousand year plan because the disciples probably would have been discouraged. It's going to take two thousand years before we get to the, the verge of you coming back and really coming back to earth and restoring everything fully because he was going to restore eventually a new heaven, a new earth, a physical kingdom here on the earth. We know that. 
after the time of tribulation. But the disciples, they want it to happen in their lifetime. And if I tell you, you're going to do a job for me, but you're never going to complete it, you're probably not going to want to sign up for that job. And so Jesus tells them, it's not for you know the times, but he makes this promise to them. He said, you shall receive power. If the political kingdom they wanted was to be delayed, power would not. They would shortly receive power with the coming of the Holy Ghost. They were wanting power, and Jesus promised them power. No, it's not physical power as Caesar's power, but it is power through Christ Jesus. It's real power, spiritual power, and, and not political power. The natural result of receiving that power would be that they would become witnesses of Jesus all over the earth. Notice that this really isn't a command. It's a simple statement of fact. When the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be witnesses of me. The words shall are the indicative, not imperative. It was This will indicate that you have received the Holy Ghost, that you will be empowered to be a mighty witness for me. If we want to be witnesses, we need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Far more important than the best course in evangelism, the best class in preaching or teaching or teaching home Bible studies is that you would be full of the power of God, that you'd be full of His Spirit, and that you would allow Him to lead you to those He'd have you teach and open their minds as you begin to teach, and His Spirit would come in and work through that class. It would be much more effective than anything we could do in ourselves. This is prophesied in Isaiah 43 and 10. The Lord proclaimed to His people that you are my witnesses. There's a cultic group today that claims this is their mandate for being Jehovah's Witnesses. But unfortunately, they failed to see that Acts 1 and 8 was the fulfillment of this and that we were not Yahweh's witnesses, but we are Jesus' witnesses. Jesus was the Jehovah of the Old Testament. And so the progress of the spread of the gospel was from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and then to the end of the earth. As I said already, Acts chapter 1 through 7 describes the gospel in Jerusalem. Chapters 8 through 12 speak of the gospel in Judea and Samaria. Chapters 13 through 28 tell of the gospel going to the end of the earth. We might imagine the objections to the places that Jesus described here. Jerusalem was where Jesus was executed by the word of an angry mob. Judea had already rejected his ministry. Samaria was regarded by the apostles at this time by the Jewish people as half-breeds, people who were not fully Jewish. They were only half-Jewish. And the uttermost parts of the earth, the Gentiles, were regarded as fuel for the fires of hell. The Jews didn't care what happened to the Gentiles. Yet God wanted them to be a witness to all the earth. And so the question today is, is Acts 1 and 8 for the church now? Yes. It's the same Spirit, the same Lord, and the same need. You need power when living as a Christian, and you need power to be a witness for Christ. Acts 1 and 8 is a promise for Jesus that you will not simply be left left empty-handed when sharing the truth of Christ, His love, and His sacrifice for sinners. You will receive power. What power? You keep saying power, Brother Brian. What power are we going to receive? Well, the power that comes... From the Spirit of God. See, it's imperative to understand that the Holy Spirit is not the third person in the Trinity. Okay? When we refer to the Holy Spirit, we are referring to God's Spirit in action. And when we refer to the Holy Spirit in you, it, Paul said that it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. He said in Romans chapter 8 that the same power and the same Spirit that quickened Jesus from the dead is the same power and same Spirit that works in our lives today. The power of the Spirit is the power of God. I like the way Brother Richardson said it last night, is that people get confused when they try to insert personage into, into the Godhead. God is not a person. God is a Spirit. And so when the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters in creation, 
he became the father of creation and the progenitor of time. And when the Spirit embodied the man Christ Jesus, he became the Son of Man and the Son of God, who was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, who is our Redeemer and our Savior. And when the Spirit empowers you, it is Christ Jesus in you, the hope of glory. And Paul said, if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. We are commanded to have that Spirit and that power working in our lives. So the power of the Spirit is the same power that opened the eyes of the blind, that opened the hearts of unbelievers, that raised people from the dead. It's the same power that rose Jesus from the dead. It's the power that comes from God Himself. This is the power that is promised to those who wait on God and follow Him because it is of God and from God for the redeemed. It is the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in you, and can move upon and through you. Power to do what? In this context, it's the power of God for the disciples to be able to preach the word and perform signs and miracles as a testimony to the power and authority of God's saving gospel. So it's the power to speak the word of God. Okay? But Mark 16 tells us that these signs will follow them that believe. They should cast out devils. They should speak with new tongues. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It's the power to do all of those things. It's the power to understand the word of God. When they received the Holy Ghost, there was sudden and profound illumination of God's word. See, we spend a lot of time trying to get people holy and separated that don't have the Holy Ghost. You cannot expect a sinner to understand holiness when they don't have the Holy Ghost. Sudden and profound illumination will come into your mind and the power of the Spirit will illuminate the Word in a fresh way that maybe you never saw it before because the scales of sin will have been lifted from your eyes. Power to experience God in a fuller way. To have a more intimate relationship. To hear His voice. To know His will. Power to see your sin and repent of it. We don't have Jiminy Cricket in our mind, ladies and gentlemen. We do have a conscience, but the Holy Ghost works in tandem with our conscience that when you do wrong, the Holy Spirit is that guide that says, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. And it brings conviction. Now, you know my pet peeve is the difference between conviction and condemnation. If you're hearing a voice that says, you're going to hell, you're a terrible person, God could never love you, that is not the Holy Ghost. That is condemnation, and we know there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. That is a lie from Satan. But if you're hearing, hey, you probably shouldn't be doing that, or you probably shouldn't go there, and you feel conviction, that's the Holy Spirit working in your life. That's Jesus and the Holy Spirit doing its job to guide you into all truth. Okay? Now, it's the power. See your sin and repent of it. It's revival in your heart. It's a desire for purity. Jesus did his miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit, by his deity that worked in him. His miracles began to happen after his baptism. We know that at his baptism, the skies opened up, the dove, like as of the Holy Spirit, not necessarily the Holy Spirit, but a representation of the Holy Spirit, came upon him. He heard the voice from heaven that said, This is my son, whom I am well pleased. All of that is a picture for you and I. Jesus didn't have to be baptized. Jesus had all power given unto him by his father okay he did that as a representation for us that we need to repent that we need to be baptized and that we need to receive the holy spirit because you are not powerful in yourself we are just creatures we are not the creators okay we are sinful in nature and we are powerless okay you'll you'll hear i, I get a little nervous about some preachers not in our movement but uh, some of those televangelists, if you ever hear one of them, that will tell you, oh, you've got enough faith, and you can speak it, and you can happen. I'll never hear them talking about the saving faith. They act as if we have power. I don't have any power. I can't command anything to happen. When Peter and John prayed for the man in Acts chapter 3, the first miracle recorded after Acts 2, and they, they commanded him to rise up and walk, the first thing they said was, silver and gold have I none. I have nothing. What I do have is authority in the name of Jesus Christ. They didn't do the miracle. Jesus did the miracle. They are nothing. He is everything. Okay? 
And so when we recognize that in our weakness, he is made strong, then we have true power with God. You need the power of God to carry out his will and not your own. How do you get this power? Well, first of all, you must fulfill Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Okay, we know that in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost has fully come. Sound of, uh, sound of mighty rushing wind comes from heaven, fills the room where they're all sitting, cloven tongues like as a fire falls upon each of them. They begin to speak in tongues as the Spirit gives them utterance. And they begin, people begin to question, what's going on here? What is this? And Peter stands up. That sudden and profound illumination, that boldness of the power of the Holy Ghost gets on him. And he begins to proclaim what Jesus had given him a few years before when he told him you're going to have the keys to the kingdom he begins to proclaim to them that that jesus that you crucified that you buried he is resurrected he has ascended and now he has scattered his spirit abroad and all of us we are not drunk as ye suppose but this is that that was prophesied by joel that in the last days i would pour out my spirit upon all flesh and when he was done preaching conviction gripped their hearts and they said what shall we do now he didn't tell them to go and tarry. He didn't tell them to go and wait. He told them, you got to repent. you got to turn from sin. you got to be baptized in the name of Jesus for the washing away of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you want the Holy Ghost, you can receive it. But first, got to go by way of repentance, and you got to have been baptized. Okay? Now, I understand there's some people who say, well, I got the Holy Ghost before I, get ba- before I got baptized. Fine. But everybody has to repent. Everybody has to recognize your need for the saving power of Jesus Christ in your life and acknowledge His blood. Maybe you received it in a prayer meeting. Acts 4 and 31 said that the Holy Spirit filled the room that the apostles were praying in. We know that as Peter was preaching, the Holy Ghost fell on Cornelius and his house. But those people had already repented. We know that after they had repented... In Acts 19, Paul laid his hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost and began to speak with tongues and prophesy. So maybe, you know, I've seen people that a preacher had to lay hands on them and then receive the Holy Ghost. I've seen people, they received it in a prayer meeting. I received it in Sunday school, okay? But the common denominator is that we all have to repent. When do you receive this power? When the Holy Spirit fills you. But to be filled, you must first be cleansed by the blood of Jesus before you can be indwelt by His Spirit. Before I fill a cup for something new, I first clean it. I'm not going to drink water, even if it's clean water, out of a dirty cup. It's not suitable for you. So we have to be cleansed. Okay? There's two areas to look at here. There's the initial gift of the Holy Ghost, the infilling of the Holy Ghost. But there's also the anointing or power of the Holy Ghost moving upon or through you, or what it terms in some places as they were full of faith and the Holy Ghost. What are some signs of the presence of the Holy Spirit in filling you? Well, obviously we believe that you'll speak in tongues. Because everywhere in Acts chapter 4 that someone received the Holy Ghost, they spoke in tongues. Now, or not Acts chapter 4, in the book of Acts, four places, four or five places in the book of Acts, the Holy Ghost was poured out. They spoke in tongues. Okay, Now, I, I was studying last night, and this, this man was building this case for why we don't speak in tongues today. And, and he goes to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul's talking about the gifts of the Spirit. And he said that we're all born into the same Spirit. We're all made to drink of the same Spirit. And that we're all one body, and he doesn't talk about tongues there. But, but it's assuming those people had already received the initial infilling of the Holy Ghost. And we know that in the Scripture it says, By the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So if I can show you five places where the Holy Ghost was poured out for the first time, and at every one of those I can show you where they spoke in tongues, okay, then you have to accept that when people receive the Holy Ghost, they're going to speak in tongues. That's not up for debate. You will speak in tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance because it wants to change what's in your heart because out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks so if the holy ghost can take control of our tongue which james tells us is a fiery and uncontrollable member then it's got control over our actions 
Your tongue dictates a lot of what you think and do. Okay? It's not up for debate. You will speak in tongues. You also will have a desire to hear God's Word, a desire to live in a repentant state and turn from sin, a desire to love others, an increase in your knowledge and understanding of God. And, of course, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, etc. Okay? Galatians 5.22. You will have the fruit of the Spirit. We talked about that the other Wednesday night. And you can't have just the fruit you like. You have to have all nine parts. Okay? But if you're truly indwelt with the Spirit, Jesus said you'll be known for your love. You'll be known for your fruit. You'll speak in tongues. Okay? That's how we know that we've received that initial infilling. But what are some signs that the anointing of the Holy Ghost, that the power of the Holy Ghost is upon you or is flowing through you, is flowing out of you? Because you're so full of faith in the Holy Ghost that it just overflows out of you. And people go, man, I want to be like Brother Stubb. And man, when he prays, it shakes heaven and, and miracles happen and the power of God is on his life. I want to walk in the fullness of the Spirit. Well, we know that there will be the manifestation of spiritual gifts as is evidence in Acts and in Corinthians and in other places. We've learned from Dr. Bernard in our Wednesday night spiritual gifts class with Sister Liam, who I thought was in here, but she's not, that, and I, I didn't, had never thought about this until he said it, but the gifts are available for the whole body to operate as the Lord sees fit on willing vessels. It is not that I possess the gift of prophecy or the gift of healing. It's that the Spirit moves in the church and if there needs to be a healing, or if there needs to be a prophecy, it moves upon that person who's full of the Spirit and who's willing to let it flow through them. Okay? So you'll see a manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit in your life. God will be able to use you in a powerful way, maybe in prophesying, maybe in speaking the Word of God with boldness, maybe in giving a word of knowledge or of tongues and interpretation. Okay? What is the purpose of of this power the root of it is simply to be witnesses for Jesus he said you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses imagine how hard it would have been to preach the gospel people knew that Jesus had been crucified they didn't necessarily know he had been resurrected if they would had no power but now when a preacher shows up and I'm sure Brother Richardson can attest to this because I know Africa is plagued with, as he taught last night, demoniacs and demonism and cultism, okay? Then when a preacher or a person shows up and your God has more power than the God that those people have been believing in, then all of a sudden, hey, I'm going to listen to that guy. He's raising people from the dead. He's healing blinded eyes. He's opening deaf ears. His God has power. His God is able to move. His God is alive. Okay, people want to serve something that's alive. It is not the power, understand, to be a witness for you. It's not to be your own witness. It's not for your own glory. It's not just for the glory of your local church, but it's for Jesus. It's for His glory. Paul said anything that he did was for His name's sake. And so out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And when the Holy Ghost is in you and upon you, you shall speak of Jesus. I don't know about you, but when I'm truly full of the Holy Ghost, I can't wait to get out of church and tell people, man, and it's not that I ran 10 laps and it's when God healed somebody or it's when God delivered somebody. You wouldn't believe we had this alcoholic that was, he was a wreck. He'd lost his family, but God delivered him from alcoholism. God's restored his marriage. God's done this. God's, you see what I'm saying? You begin to let that overflow. And so the question is, what kind of witness are we? I love in Acts chapter 19, Paul's going through the coast of uh, Caesarea and Philippi. And he comes across some men and begins to dialogue with them. And he tells them, he says, now they hadn't said anything to him, as the Bible records. He looks at me and says, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Now, here's what I find fascinating. He knew they were a believer of some base level of Christianity, okay? And they didn't even have the Holy Ghost. They were exuding something that showed that they were different. And they didn't even have the Holy Ghost. He prays for them. He reveals to them the Holy Ghost. He, he tells them, you were baptized in the John's baptism. That was repentance. But now you must be baptized in Jesus' name and receive the Holy Ghost. They do that. They receive it. They can speak in tongues and magnify God. 
okay? But the point here is men that didn't even have the Holy Ghost were signified as believers. You and I have the Holy Ghost. How much more should people say, there's something different about Brother Tony. There's something different about Brother Kenny. There's something different about Brother Caleb. There's something different about Sister Megan. She, she's, uh, uh, people in the world only call you brother or sister, but there's something different about that person. They, they just radiate the happiness and the joy of God, the peace of God. When they're around, I, I feel calm, and they're not talking about people, and they're not worried about who's going to be president and what's going to happen to the economy because they know God is on the throne and God is in control. They have hope for tomorrow. They have joy for today. There's something different. What kind of witness are you? I promise you, you'll be a much better witness if you're allowing the Holy Ghost to fill you to overflowing. Finally, Jesus tells us where we are to be a witness for him. Can I give you a clue? Yes, he names some geographical places, but what he's really getting at is everywhere. Everywhere. The text speaks of their present location, Jerusalem. For you, that would be where you live. Maybe it's in your home. You know, if you're living one way at home and another way at church, something wrong with your Holy Ghost. I don't know if y'all see those Kermit the Frog memes on Facebook. You know, I'm not going to lie, I'm, I'm a Facebook junkie. You know, he's sipping the tea. And, and there's one that says, if your Holy Ghost makes you run laps on Sunday night and live like the devil the rest of the week, you don't have the Holy Ghost. you got ADHD. I'm just saying. Okay? There's something wrong with your Holy Ghost if you're not living at home in your private life the way you're trying to display in your public life. When you're truly full of the power of God, you'll live the same way everywhere. So first of all, he tells them in Jerusalem, in your home, young people, in your school, adults, in your workplace, you're going to be full of the power of God and you're going to be a witness in your church, everywhere you go, in Jerusalem, okay? Then he tells them, he says, uh, in, in Samaria, no, I'm sorry, in Judea, okay? Then it speaks of their outlying area, taking it to the city, outside of their home and church, those closest to them. Now we're getting into Smyrna. People of Smyrna need to know the power of God, need to see what's different about us. Then maybe it takes them a little further to the Tennessee district. And he starts talking about going out into Samaria, to those outside even of our city. It is possible for churches to reach outside of their city. I've been a part of a church that was pulling people from 12 cities around it because they didn't have anywhere else to go. Okay? You want to be that kind of church that people say, I want to be a part of that church because the power of God is moving and flowing in their saints and, and changing lives. And then finally, he tells us we to be witnesses to the world. It's easy sometimes to be a witness for him only in church or among our friends who are also Christians. But it gets difficult when we have to stand for Jesus when things are inconvenient. And that's where the Holy Ghost has to override our feelings, our fears, our faults, and move us to sacrifice in love to our fellow man and in obedience to God. This city needs your witness of Jesus. He has commissioned us to go ye therefore and preach the gospel. If the Holy Spirit that gives you power, the strength, the boldness, the ability, and the confidence to be witnesses for Jesus, because you can't do it on your own. If you want to be a bolder witness for Jesus, you need to be praying for it. You need to be obeying the Lord and submitting to the will of the Lord. Don't be scared of experiencing more of God. Don't be scared to be a witness for God. Allow the Holy Ghost to empower you in a way it never has before. And so today you're going to hear preaching on missions, on, on taking the gospel to the whole world. Okay, you say, well, Brother Brian, I, I can't go to the whole world. i got a job here. No, you can't go to the whole world. And that's where giving comes in. You're going to hear more about that. But that's where the Holy Ghost emboldens us to give in maybe a way we hadn't given. Emboldens us to pray in maybe a way we hadn't prayed. Okay? Burdens us to pray for missionaries and pray for those that have gone because we want to take the whole gospel to the whole world. I want my family to be saved. I want my house to be saved. I want my church to be saved. I want my city to be saved, my state, my country, and my world. Everybody, everywhere deserves to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So today... We're encouraging you, and young people, we're going to talk more about this in the coming weeks. We're going to talk more about what it means to be a witness in your home, to be a witness in your school, to be a witness everywhere you go. 
but I kind of wanted to go back and revisit the first few verses and lay the groundwork with the young people and encourage the grown folks that if you're not walking in the fullness of the Spirit, do not leave this place today without the power of the Holy Ghost coming alive in you afresh and anew and awakening you a desire to be a witness for Him and to reach your mission field and your harvest and do what you can to spread His gospel. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day, God. We thank you for your word. God, I pray that something that was said would be good seed, that would be received and would grow in people's hearts, would illuminate their minds, God, that you would move in us today, that you would anoint Brother Richardson to deliver a powerful word and anoint our ears to hear and receive it. Give us a good day. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Sunday school offering. Brother Carter's coming around right now. This, of course, goes to Global Missions. So if you would, make sure to uh, give in the Sunday school offering. Thank you.